want to talk about friction today, and we want to limit ourselves here to dry friction or Coulomb friction. We're not talking about anything lubricated here. Friction is another force. We treat it like a point force acting tangent to the surface in an opposite direction from how motion would occur if there were no friction. This is another of the three kinds of ways we can model a surface. We can model a surface as a frictionless thing, so there are no tangential forces or as a completely rough surface where you can have as much tangential force as you need to prohibit motion along a surface, or as friction. Here, motion might occur, but it might not. That's what we need to know about. Friction depends on the surface nature, so it comes from irregularities in the surface or some sort of molecular attraction between the two surfaces. It does not depend on the area of the contact. So if you have two great big things and they're touching at one pi tiny point or one huge surface, it doesn't make any difference. The big point here is that it is limited in magnitude. This comes in well with this word might. So if you have a block here and you're pushing on it with a force P, the friction force acts tangent to the surface, opposite the way it would move if there were no friction. And you obviously have a normal force. If you plotted these two, so you have a, how is F changing as P changes, at the first part they're one to one because the sum of the forces in X gives you F equals P. But we know that if you're pushing on something, sooner or later it will move. Sooner or later you get to F max. F max is equal to some constant times N. This constant is called the coefficient of static friction, mu S. After that, friction is only one value. It comes in at mu sub K times N. That's the coefficient of kinetic friction. This is true F equals mu n only at this one point, at the very top of this curve. So those of you who learned in friction that F equals mu n, this is only true if motion is impending. Let's blow up this free body diagram a little bit more and put some distances on it. So if I say my box is 2b wide and the p is pushing at a height h, the n cannot act right under the weight. It has to act somewhere on this side of it. As P increases, this X value is going to increase as well. Anything it can to keep this in equilibrium. So let's look at what these equations are. The sum of the forces in X just tells you P equals F. The sum of the forces in Y tells you N equals W. The sum of the moments, if you take it right under the weight, tells you that N times that X is equal to P times H. If there's no x, if n acts right under the weight, you can't have a p to maintain equilibrium. As p increases, this x has to increase as well. Until you get to a certain point when this n has moved over this way as far as it'll go, and it can't go any further, then you have your tipping condition. If x equals b, tipping occurs. We also have the possibility now that it could slip. We could get past our maximum friction force then we'll have slipping. These are not both going to happen. One of them is going to happen, the other one won't. So how do we handle this? We draw the free body diagram and write equations of equilibrium for our case. We're going to assume that it's not going to tip. We're going to assume it's not going to slip. And then you have to come back and check. Did it slip? Did it tip? If rotation cannot occur, so if your box is stuck into a corner where it can't possibly tip over, then you can treat it like a particle and you don't have to worry about this. The friction angle is called phi. There are a lot of different ways you can uh, define a force. You can say it's magnitude and direction, Cartesian form, or magnitude along the line. When we're talking about F and N, we're talking about a Cartesian form, something perpendicular to and along the surface. But this all makes up simply the reaction of the surface. If you add them together, we call that the resultant R. And the angle is usually called phi. So tan phi where phi is between n and r. Tan phi is f over n. This gets to be useful when you've got only a couple extra forces. So if you have a, a block sliding down an incline of its own accord or that kind of thing, then we can use a force triangle with this resultant r. At our magic top point of the graph where I have impending motion, tan phi is going to be f max over n or tan phi s equals mu s. This phi s is called the angle of static friction, or if you're talking about a block in an incline, we call it the angle of repose. Oops.
mess. I have four cases here of looking at my graph. I can look at it where it's zero, I can look at it somewhere along in here, I can look at it at the top, or I can look at it past where it has gotten to the flat part. Let me put this here so it doesn't fall over. So here's my free body diagram. Now I want to let P be at some sort of angle. If P is at some sort of angle, theta, how does this whole system change as theta changes? If theta is 90, so you're pushing straight down, that's, I have no friction. That's living at this origin here. F can be zero, and will be in some cases, or tan phi is equal to zero. Or you can have friction, but no motion, and not even close to it. Then I get from my sum of the forces in x, f equals p cosine theta, or px. Tan phi is still f over n by definition, but I don't have f max equals mu times n. I'm not equal to that until I get to motion impending. When I get to motion impending, f is equal to px still because of the sum of the forces in x. But now it's equal to f max from mu s times n. This is my angle of static friction phi s, where I have tan phi s equals mu s. Or I could live out here on this part of the graph where I have f is equal to px, but now this is f sub k, or mu k times n, or tan phi k. All the s's become k's. That's how that works. So those are my four possibilities. The other two things you've got to remember is that friction, or one thing, the friction has to be relative motion. So if you're looking at the friction between a surface and you draw the free body diagram of one side or the other, friction is going to oppose how the block moves relative to the rest of the world if it were staying still. So I can consider the red block as if the green block were staying still, or the other way around. When you draw the free body diagram of both of them, you have to use equal and opposite forces on each side. And by that I mean the same label and opposite in the arrows in the other direction. So if I look at the red block, the red block is moving up relative to the green one. That means that friction is acting down, and the normal force has to be there. Note, you cannot have a friction force without a normal force, because f max equals mu times n. So if there's no n, there's no f. So this is my relative motion of the red block. The green block has to have equal and opposite things on the other side. So if fa is going down, fa is going up. If na is going to the left, na is going to the right on the green block. And how does that work? If you look at the green block, the green block is moving down relative to the universe. That means friction is acting up relative to the universe. If you picked this up and superimposed it back on top of this, these forces would be internal if you considered it all together, and these have to go away. So when you look at the free body diagrams of both sides, you have to make sure you're using equal and opposite reactions. In the next video, we'll look at the steps you use for solving some of these equations and a couple examples. Thanks.